Ghost. Amen. Dear Canons, dear faithful, I have a confession to make tonight. The theme chosen tonight by our dear Canons is spiritual sloth. And I'm still wondering if maybe the theme was entrusted to me because the French have the reputation to be specialist for strike. It's, in any case, it's for me a good opportunity to make my personal examination of conscience tonight with you. What is spiritual sloth? Our dictionary defines sloth as an aversion to work, laziness, indolence. These words wake up our indignation when we observe a co-worker or a family member failing to bear a reasonable share in a common enterprise, we don't like that. However, this definition of sloth as laziness or indolence does not go profound enough. It is not exactly the sin of spiritual sloth. What is the sin of sloth? What is the difference, what distinguishes the sin of sloth from merely wasting time with a computer or a TV screen? What is the difference between this kind of laziness and spiritual sloth? Spiritual sloth is not wasting time, it's deeper than that. It is a rejection of God's love. Spiritual sloth is called in Latin ascedia, which means moroseness, sadness, even peevishness. Known of these should be confused with the mere laziness, the waste of time of the dictionary definition, or with also the clinical depression, which, because it is a physical and psychological illness, is not sinful. St. Thomas Aquinas says that sloth is a sluggishness of the mind which neglects to begin good. Since then, a spiritual good is a good in very truth. Sorrow about spiritual good is evil in itself. And yet, that sorrow also, which is about a real evil, is evil in its effect. If it so oppresses a man as to draw him away entirely from good deeds. So this spiritual sloth is an ailment, an illness, a sin with two main parts. There is the lassitude of sloth and here the soul rejects a spiritual good and there is another, another side, another hand that encourages us to, refla to refrain from employing that good in our relation with God or with our neighbor. Achedia or spiritual sloth goes so far as to refuse the joy that comes from God and to be repelled by divine goodness. 
Why are we able to embrace this achedia, this spiritual sloth? One might reasonably shirk from some of the most onerous responsibility of our Christian life simply because occasionally at least these obligations seem too difficult, too challenging for us. Doing nothing might seem a far more attractive option than practicing some of the works of mercy. However, why would anyone turn from God's love and willingly embrace spiritual sadness in its place? The church theologians give a number of explanations. One is succumbing to simple lassitude. Any of us may, may find our prior life boring or unproductive, and this can lead to a grumbling, what is the point? Turning aside for, from prior and wallowing in, a, in an ocean, in a sea of self-pity. Another cause of sloth, of spiritual sloth, is allowing ourselves to get so caught up with the demands of our everyday life that we feel we have no time for the deep intimacy our faith tells us we must cultivate with our good Lord. This busyness may seem to contradict the notion of sloth as a kind of lethargy. But if we allow our work or other responsibilities to impinge upon our spiritual life, we may find ourselves turning away from prayer and happily identifying it as simply one more tiring claim upon our already overbooked calendar. What are the remedies against spiritual sloth called achedia in Latin? Sloth triumph when we remove or when we omit God from our daily moral landscape. The first medication is the third commandment, telling us to keep holy the Sabbath day, the Lord's day. This is not an invitation to do nothing. Rather, it is an invitation to embrace the peace of the Lord's day and to find one more source of joy in our relations with the Lord. The second remedy, keeping watch, study. The daily habit of spiritual reading, even if it is very short, is a weapon against decreasing vigilance and carelessness of heart. And fortunately, modern medias come to our assistance in this need. Online Holy Scripture and teachings of the Church are very easily accessible nowadays. Third remedy, prior. It is important. Challenging ourselves to be more diligent in prior is another way to fight against spiritual sloth. Saint Benedict, patron saint in our institute, gave us three famous words. Ora et labora. Prayer and work. And these two realities put sloth to rout, to defeat. Does prayer leave you with impressions of fatigue, too long, 
I am not listened, maybe? Then, if you have this impression in your soul, start with simple prayers. Even a prayer as short as, and also simple as a sign of the cross, if done with an earnest heart, can start to send sloth into retreat. Indeed, some of the most zealous saints prayed the sign of the cross many times in each day. It is hard to let your mind wander after negative, dark, and sad things when you are repeatedly praying that all of your thoughts, words, and deeds may be done in the name of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. The sign of the cross is powerful. We may not immediately identify prayer with justice, but the Catholic theology teaches the virtue of justice is giving to others what they deserve. Prayer is one of the acts that is God's due. To pray not only draws us closer to God and further away from sloth, but prayer enables us to practice one of the cardinal virtues, those good habits that are opposed to the cardinal sins. Fourth remedy, a good confession. The confessional is the frosting on the spiritual cake that delivers us from sloth. Sloth encourages us to do nothing, to care about nothing, to behave as if nothing matters but our own discontent. A good confession is an opportunity to overcome each of those temptations. The reason for this is quite simple. The sacrament of penance demands our active participation. And first step, I have to go myself to the confessional. And I wonder what have I done, what have I failed to do? What do I wish I had done differently? Finally, we must be willing to embrace the challenge to change. We may not be the most enthusiastic of penance, but seeking the sacrament of penance is to take a giant step away from the mire of flows. Fifth remedies, the example of Our Lady. Let us consider tonight the calm, the quiet, and the serenity of the Virgin Mary. After the evangelist Saint Luke describes Gabriel's telling Mary she is to be the mother of our Savior, Saint Luke describes Mary's visitation to Saint Elizabeth, her cousin. And he tells us that she paid her visit in haste. What is important here is Mary's paying her visit in haste, but not in a hurry. The dictionary defines haste as sp speed, but also the dictionary adds that it is speed combined with a certain purpose or dispatch. There is a goal. Calm people don't need to be in a hurry because they hasten at the right moment about the right things. And now I bet that you are eagerly expecting a conclusion for a too long French sermon. 
the challenge of Mary's haste. In the purgatory of Dante's divine comedy, the slothful souls repent of their sinful spiritual indifference by racing up the mountain of purgatory with, this is a quote, goodwill and right affection. These souls in the lead cry out the passage from the Gospel of Saint Luke. They, they, they say, Mary went with haste into the hill country. They accompany these words, Dante says, with the admonition, haste, haste, lest time be lost through little love. Dear faithful, we make a mistake if we imagine the gospel is a record of things that happened to other people somewhere else a long time ago. In fact, the gospel is a story told about us here and now. Each of the individuals we meet in the gospel accounts is a reflection of us. And each of them illustrates what we ought to be doing or what we ought to avoid. Our Lady, our Blessed Mother, is the model for our souls. She is also the model for the Church. So she is our model in all things. She is the Church's first tabernacle. Even we could say we are going to attend soon the benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. Our Lady has been the first monstrance of her son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The first monstrance. When we see the monstrance, let us think about Our Lady. And in the visitation, she showed us her soul willing to live behind all the comfort and security of home to proclaim the good news of the salvation of the redemption operated by our Lord. As she is willing to do it in haste, our baptism calls us to do the same. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.